Coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap, it's been called the largest denial of service attack in history. But this week, we'll bust past the hype and tell you how DNS reflection attacks actually work. Plus, the privacy surprise in BlackBerry 10, the return of an old segment, your questions, and much, much more in this week's episode of TechSnap. everyone, and welcome to TechSnap. This is episode 104 of Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems network and administration podcast. We stream this episode live on April 4th, 404 day, 2013. This episode is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. I'll tell you more about them as the show goes on. And the live stream is powered by the incredible ScaleEngine.com. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, the admin, the tech, and the teacher, Mr. Alan Jude. Hey there, Alan. Hey, Chris, everybody. Thanks for watching. Hey, man. Welcome, everybody, to episode 104 of the TechSnap program. And uh, this week, Alan, we're going to cover a couple of details that uh, on a story that is kind of new to me, so I'm really happy you're touching on this. But I think the best part of the show is, A, not only the return of the Bitcoin blaster at the end, <laughs> which is funny, and, and for the people who hate it, they can tune out then, but we also have a really awesome feedback segment this week. Tons of good questions came in, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting to that. But why don't we start with this... Uh, some details that came out from this massive denial of service attack that was reported on last week. Right. This was uh, a week or two ago, and you know the chat room was going crazy about it, and there was just <laughs> a lot of hype, and so I knew for a fact that it was all bogus. Right. Uh, so I've finally had the time to dig into it, and I have you know the insider details to let you know what actually happened. So a little debunking and some technical details, some actual technical yes. details. Yes. What a concept. All right, where do we start? Uh, right, so... Uh, you know, as everyone is probably aware, because of the mainstream media and everybody else, uh, there was a large denial of service attack against SpamHost, which is basically a DNS blacklist of spammers. Um, and reportedly, this attack came from CyberBunker, which is an ISP in the Netherlands, which claims they will host anything that's not child pornography or terrorism. Uh, I've heard rumors, at least from John C. Dvorak, that they also potentially might be a host of WikiLeaks. Don't know. Probably. Yeah. Uh, but they're, uh, the name Cyberbunker is because they're actually in a NATO bunker. Uh, oh, that the government right. sold off. The, the government sold off this bunker as surplus, and they bought it and built it into a data center. Right. And so it was designed to survive a moderately sized nuclear detonation relatively close to the bunker, right? Because it was a command and control center for NATO. So if there had actually been a war between NATO and the Warsaw Pact, that probably would have been a target for you know, ICBMs. Right. Uh, and so, you know, they close the door and nobody can get in. Right? Uh, the, uh, the Ars Technica article at the bottom has a link to some claims from CyberBunker that a SWAT team attempted to raid their facility and couldn't get in because of the blast door. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, they actually have it right here on their uh, front page of their website. Yeah. SWAT team raids the bunker but can't make it in. And they're like, we have security camera video, but we're not showing it. But anyway, uh, anyway, there was a lot of hype made over the attack because it was very large and made use of a rather sophisticated technique compared to what we'd normally see. Hmm. Uh, but basically, while the headlines all read that you know this was like the internet equivalent of a nuclear weapon or the biggest denial of service attack ever in history and it was so big it broke the internet and so on, it's not really true. The attack did not break the internet in any way. <laughs> right. Nobody's okay. internet even really got any slower. Uh, some routing changes were made. Some traffic went around certain places. But that happens on a daily basis on the internet. There is nothing out of the ordinary, really. Uh, and that the attack was not really that unusually large. Uh, one of the providers that provides uh, transit to Cloudflare, which was the company that was hosting the spam host stuff to protect it from the denial of service attack, uh, said that the attack was maybe 10 or 15% larger than the large attacks they see on a regular basis. So it really wasn't that big. Or, you know, you look at a graph on like Arbor Networks who sells anti-denial of service devices. Yeah. You know, a box is supposed to protect you. Yeah. On their website, they're like, oh, yeah, the biggest attack was like 100 megabits or 100 gigabits and now it was 300. You 300, better buy a box right. from us. Right. It's like, it's like me. And this graph is like, the attackers are getting huge. You need to buy a big expensive box from us. Yeah, act now before or, it's too late. And the Cloudflare is <laughs> like, yeah, you need to pay us a lot of money. Right, right. 
Well, so, yeah, and a uh, lot of B- this was all just marketing hype. Well, and a and- lot of the news agencies were really like uh, uh, the BBC called the global internet the global internet slows after the biggest attack in history, and they called it uh, equivalent to uh, machine guns mowing down crowds of people. Only in this case, it was websites, and the equivalent of one nation dropping a nuclear bomb on another nation. That's yeah, well, literally their words in the report. You get reporters that don't know what they're talking about, and then they're talking to a company that would benefit from the fear, uncertainty, and doubt created by making these ridiculous claims like it slowed down the entire internet. Right, and so often, like uh, in this case, they brought on a representative from one of these companies to describe what was going on. Well, of course it's in their best interest to hype it up and make it dramatic, and they bring them on as quote-unquote experts, when really they're special interests. Yeah, and exactly, that's that's the issue. so this particular attack, as I described, used a kind of a different technique. Uh, it made use of what's called a DNS reflection attack. Mm. So DNS, as we know, is the protocol that resolves host names like Google.com into the IP address so you can actually make a connection to it to request a file or whatever. Uh, because in a regular TCP connection, which is what almost everything on the Internet is, like you know, if you're connecting to a website, you do it over TCP, uh, it has what's called a three-way handshake, right? You say, I want to connect to you, and the other side says, okay, here's some details, and then you reply, and then it establishes a connection. Mm-hmm. Because of that, there's a lot of back and forth, right? There's three-way handshake requires going there, coming back, going there again, and then the connection starts at that point. And then, you know, it's the fourth step before you can actually send any data to the remote side. Is this so, also been called the DNS? Because I think I've heard, was this what I heard called a DNS amplification attack, or am I getting it confused? Yes. Yes, okay. the DNS amplification attack. Okay, yeah. All uh, right, that's, I'll, yeah. Describe, I'll describe the amplifying aspect as well. Okay. Um, so, yeah, in TCP, we have a lot of back and forth. So if you're talking to someone far away that's like, you know, 200 millisecond latency, then it's going to take like a whole second in order to establish the connection and get that first bit of data delivered. With UDP, uh, you just send the data and you don't care if it gets there, right? The reason TCP has the three-way handshake is it sets up a scheme to be able to figure out, all right, I want to make sure that this entire message gets to the other side without being corrupted and in the right order. UDP doesn't care. Mm. Send a message, hope it gets there. Send a bunch of messages, hope they happen to be in the right order. Right. So for DNS, because we want it to be as fast as possible, it goes over UDP, right? You just say, What's the address of Google? And the server gets it and then sends back a reply. Uh, in order to deal with the fact that it might get lost, if you don't get an answer in two seconds, you send a second request or send a, a request to a second server. Right? So you just keep asking people until somebody tells you. Right? You don't check whether they heard that you asked them. You just keep asking someone until someone gives you the answer. Right. Anyway, uh, because it's just send and then receive, it's a lot faster. Uh, the problem with UDP because of the system we just described, you don't have to get the reply. So basically, you can write a UDP packet and lie about your IP address. Mm. Say, you know, so I'm sending from network A to network B saying my IP address is network C. So when the DNS server gets the request, it sends the response to the person you're pretending to be, not you. In TCP, that wouldn't work because you wouldn't be able to set up the, the connection. The three-way handshake wouldn't work. Because if, um, if I send the request and the, the first step of the three-way handshake and the second step goes to some random person that wasn't expecting it, mm-hmm. they're not going to do the third step. And so the connection never gets established, right? And data can never be sent. Right. But uh, for UDP, because there's no handshake, you can just lie and the answer gets sent to the other person. So in this case... Uh, they would do this DNS reflection attack where instead of asking, you know, a DNS server, hey, what's the IP address of Google? They would send, hey, I'm pretending to be spam hoss. What's the IP address or what's the, you know, do a zone transfer of this address or something. It would ask a very large question or a small question that has a very large answer. So it would provide this amplification attack, right? So the attacker sends a very small message that causes the DNS server to generate a very large response and send it to the wrong person. Right? So the attacker can use a small amount of bandwidth to make requests to a whole bunch of these uh, DNS servers all around the world, and then all those DNS servers are generate this big response and send it to the victim. Wow. That seems like a 
hard problem to fight against, actually, right? Well, see, normally a DNS server <clears throat> will only respond to requests or questions uh, about the domains that it's set up for. Okay. Right? Like the, the Google, uh, Google's a bad example because they run a public DNS service, but yeah. Uh, you know, if you look up scaleengine.com, oh, okay. you normally ask your ISP, and your ISP will then ask the scale engine servers. If you tried to ask the scale engine servers directly, you would still get an answer. But if you ask the scale engine servers directly for Google, they will tell you, go ask Google. Why are you asking me? <laughs> get so out of here, they, kid. What's the they, matter? They'll just, they'll just not answer or right. send a very, very small message back saying, not allowed. Uh, and at the same time, if I try to ask someone else's ISP, they'll refuse it, right? So normally, the DNS, recursive DNS server at your ISP is set up only to accept requests from their own clients, right? So that Verizon users don't use the Comcast DNS server, because why should Comcast be paying for that, right? But around the internet, there's a bunch of smaller servers that are set up as open. They'll uh, do recursive requests from anybody, which is a problem, uh, because they can then be used as part of this reflection attack. Yeah. So normally, a DNS server should be restricted to only accept recursive queries from people it trusts, usually people inside its own network. Mm -hmm. Whether that's, you know, if you're the ISP, it's all your clients. If you're setting it up at home, you'd only allow requests from the LAN side. You wouldn't accept any from the internet side. You know, and, and things like that. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, there's an initiative out there to find all of these open DNS servers and shut them down so that they can't be used as part of these attacks. Uh, and, you know, hopefully that happens. Uh, the numbers has been going down, and that's good. Mm. Uh, part of that is that the defaults in when you set up a name server are different now. Uh, you know, in the past, the default was that the name server would, you know, run on your internet-facing IP or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, usually not recursively, but sometimes. Uh, but you know, the default in buying nowadays is to listen on localhost only, and you have to specifically configure it to point at the internet. Although a lot of lazy people will say, oh, I'll let requests come from anybody. Don't worry about it. Until you, know, you rack up a huge bandwidth bill on outgoing because you were used as part of this attack. Right. Yeah, uh, so this is no, something... Sorry. Don't confuse OpenDNS.com, the people that run a large recursive DNS server for everybody to use that's usually faster than your ISP, with a DNS server that's open to take requests from anybody run by some Joe Schmo somewhere that is breaking the internet. They're not the same thing, <laughs> uh, even though they have similar sounding names. This is something that Cloudflare has made a ton of uh, publicity around. What do you think of that? That they're a company trying to make money. <laughs> you know, we've talked about Cloudflare a number of times on the show, yeah. and usually it's when they screw up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, you don't have. Uh, so you. Don't I, have I don't say anything specific because they're a competitor of ours, and I don't want to uh, let that cloud the issue. Right. So I usually right. just avoid it, gotcha. except for when interesting technical things happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but I won't get into marketing and so on. <laughs> Speaking of marketing, should we take a break right here, or do you have any other thoughts on that? No, we got a bit more stuff here. Okay. Uh, so yeah, the forge from address uh, in the UDP packet makes the response go to the victim instead of the original person that requested it. Mm -hmm. And because the response generated is bigger than the request, it's an amplification attack because it means uh, as the attacker, I don't have to have 300 gigabits of upload capacity. Right. That's the I great thing about it. I can a smaller amount, like 10 gigabits, and then have it amplified by all these servers to become right. the 300 gigabits. I mean, not a great thing about it, but that's sort of the genius yeah. thing about it. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, so one possible solution uh, to this type of thing is if all ISPs were to do egress filtering, which is basically to block any traffic from leaving their network that has a from address that isn't from within inside their network. Mm. Right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, that way people couldn't lie about their IP address because any traffic coming from, say, inside Comcast that had a from address that wasn't Comcast would cause a problem. Sword saying, not really traceable, no. Chat room uh, question. Yeah. <laughs> Random chat room question. Yeah, it was, he was asking, is an attack like this traceable to the source? Not in particular. In this case, it was more... Other data was used to make the connections. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because it's related guess, to CyberBunker. Because whoever is under attack, the source looks like the DNS servers. 
Right, exactly. Hmm. Um, password VPN traffic is encapsulated. So the VPN traffic has a from address of your IS IP address from your ISP and a destination address of your VPN server. Then inside that packet, there is other stuff. Uh, it has you know, an actual, basically it's a packet inside a packet. So yeah, because the, the internal IP addresses are inside the packet that's inside the one that has the real addresses, your ISP wouldn't, it wouldn't break VPN traffic. Don't worry about that. Uh, anyway, so a solution would be to block the forged traffic as it leaves networks. Uh, that might not have helped in this particular case, though, because CyberBunker is an ISP, right? They have their own autonomous system number. They're part of the routing network on the Internet, and basically they'd be responsible for filtering out these type of packets. Mm -hmm. And if it's them that's generating them, <laughs> they would filter them. Yes, correct. Uh, so, yeah, some of the real details uh, started to emerge uh, with what... Uh, was reported, you know, when the attack was reported that to be so large that it disrupted the London Internet Exchange, that's not entirely true. It's not that the attack was so large that it broke the Internet Exchange. It's that the attackers got clever and specifically targeted parts of the London Internet Exchange to take it down. Oh, uh, okay. All right. So it wasn't, it, so it wasn't, it, it was more like they did a specific denial of service attack against them. Yeah, so yeah. basically, uh, what, uh, here I have a link to a response from uh, the CTO of GTT, which is one of the upstream providers of Cloudflare. Yeah. Uh, and basically, he describes what actually happened was that CyberBunker managed to get uh, the IP address of some of the internal parts of the London Internet Exchange. So the way an Internet Exchanges work is it basically a whole bunch of ISPs all hooked up to a really big switch. Uh, and they each have one IP address, and they exchange routes over it. Normally, that set of IP addresses that they all have is not published out to the Internet. right? There's no way to get to those IP addresses unless you're actually plugged into the switch. Mm. But a common misconfiguration is that people rebroadcast that subset of networks out over their link. And so because of a misconfiguration by a number of members of the London Internet Exchange, the internal IP addresses had a route, out to the, or route in from the Internet. And CyberBunker managed to use that to attack the exchange itself and, and disrupt it. I see. Uh, and within an hour, that was fixed by the London Internet Exchange basically finding out who was leaking the route and having to withdraw the route. And then all of a sudden, there was no way to reach those IP addresses uh, from the outside Internet. That is an, one of the interesting elements of the story is how well these different companies worked together to sort of resolve this issue. Well, basically to could. join an internet exchange like the London Internet Exchange or, uh, as we'll talk about in a minute, the Netherlands Internet Exchange or the Toronto, you know, there's lots of these exchanges. Uh, you're required to have a 24-7 network operations center uh, for dealing with issues like this, mm. right? Uh, because, yeah, this has to... <laughs> you know, this, if you have a misconfiguration, you could be breaking the entire internet, right? We've seen this before where uh, countries were trying to block YouTube and their route leaked upstream and caused YouTube to break for people outside of that ISP or outside of that country. Right. Right. And that's, you know, so if you make a misconfiguration and you're part of one of these exchanges, your route could leak out and cause huge problems. So in order to join, you have to meet these minimum requirements of being able to solve these problems very quickly and work with people like so this. they have high standards yes good they, as they did <clears throat> uh but yeah so they managed to actually attack the exchange itself and that's why there was a problem not just because of the size of their attack it, it seems more like the large part of the denial of service attack was just cover for them to be doing sneakier stuff like what well the in this case, taking down the internet exchange. Basically, they were just oh, trying... Oh, okay, okay, Basically, I, see, I, follow. I thought their, you were... their, their large attack wasn't taking down uh, Spam Hoss anymore. So they tried to do other things to break it. All right. Uh, so channels. one of the other things they did is BGP Mon, which is a website that monitors the BGP system across the internet, uh, found that CyberBunker, who is the attackers, were doing a BGP hijack uh, via the... Netherlands Internet Exchange. So basically what they did is they said, hey, we have a route to get to the IP address of the main spam host name server. And uh, basically they broadcast a route for a slash 32, which is basically one specific IP address. Hmm. 
the way routing works is you always trying to find the route that is the most specific, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Like basically you create a route uh, and you do it for as large a network as possible, right? So you say all of these computers, the easiest way to get to them is go here and then each step. And eventually the routes get more specific. But basically the most specific route is always the one you want to follow. Because basically you just say to get to all computers in this range, go over here, except for the smaller range inside of that that's actually over here. Yeah. Uh, in order to make that work, you always look for the, the, the most specific route. So basically, they broadcast the most specific route possible for the uh, spam host name server. And through that, basically, for all networks connected to the Netherlands Internet Exchange, all the traffic that was trying to find the spam host name server would actually go to a cyberbunker server instead, where they uh, had set it up so the cyberbunker server reported that every possible address was a spam source. So anyone using SpamHoss and connected to the, uh, an ISP that was connected to this internet exchange and was using SpamHoss would mark all of their email as spam, which would, uh, in the eyes of CyberUnker, would cause people to stop using SpamHoss. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, this entire attack started because CyberUnker had their IP ranges blocked by SpamHoss because CyberUnker will host spammers. And SpamHoss's job is to stop that. <laughs> right. Uh, there's a little back and forth. You know, a lot of ISPs feel that spam house basically bla uh, blackmails you into doing whatever they want or paying them in order to get delisted. I've, I've felt that way sometimes. Yeah. Uh, you, although most spam blacklists, you know, if you stop being a source of spam, they'll remove you after 24 hours. Or yeah, yeah. if you request, they'll remove you. There's right. not very many that require you to pay. Right. Although some there, of them though. will be, if you have got listed like 10 times and keep requesting removal, then at some point they're going to charge you because you're wasting their time all the time. Yeah, that's happened to a client of mine. Who, they had a Windows box that got malware on it and was spamming. Yeah. Yeah. And they didn't have uh, outbound ports blocked, so. Yeah. Uh, also in the past, CyberBunker has done a similar BGP hijack. And what they did was uh, announce a route for a set of IP addresses that are normally not announced on the internet. Uh, mm -hmm. A set of IP addresses belonging to the U.S. Department of Defense oh. that are basically used <laughs> internally, but yeah. there's no way to reach them from the internet. Ah. Well, CyberBunker announced it so that you would reach those IP addresses and they would reach to them, and then they use them to send spam because that list of IP addresses wouldn't be on any blacklist because it normally isn't even on the internet. That's pretty clever. So they stole those IPs right. using a BGP hijack and then used them as a source of spam, and then once they got blacklisted and they were no use anymore, they stopped hijacking it. And basically, because those IPs normally aren't on the internet, no one noticed at first. But, you know, the sites like BGP Mon keep an eye out for stuff like that. And uh, That's it seems shady. like at this point that if things like this keep happening, that upstream ISPs are going to not want to deal with CyberBunker and they'll just basically be disconnected uh, because they're basically abusing the trust system of the internet. It's too bad. It's an interesting. It sounds like such a trivial thing, though, in some respects, to start this whole thing up over. Yep. I think that's kind of. So this happened many times before. You know, if you <laughs> Google for spam hosts, you see there's history of you know people trying to sue them and denial of service attacks and all kinds of stuff. I uh, I found that uh, I found that I I just sort of sat back and watched the whole show happen and now you actually hear the details about it. It actually sounds like some clever stuff. I mean, that DNS amplification attack, that's like a big bang for your buck there. That's a Right, although, you know, that attack has existed for like 20 years. Yeah, right. Uh, it's just, I... Just now, most people's home internet is much faster now. Uh, you know, there's lots of these servers out there. There's a web... The website that's trying to get rid of all of these has a list of them, which may have actually been used as a source to get a list of them to do the attack. One of the things I kept kind of just like scratching my head is like they kept saying they're, they're using a flaw in the fundamental design of the internet. And they kept saying in the plumbing of the internet, there's a flaw in the way that names are converted to addresses. And that's what they're exploiting. I kept thinking, but they wouldn't go any more details than that. They just get, wouldn't well, give me any more info. Basically, it's a misconfiguration, not a flaw in the way the internet works. If there is a flaw, it's the right. fact that BGP doesn't enforce more trust stuff, but that's mostly because it's easier to not have complicated rules and trust the ISPs will do the right thing uh, 
and if not de-peering with them because it allows more flexibility, right? If you have all these rules, then it limits what ISPs can do and it basically just delays everything. Yeah. Yeah, and the system mostly works, so why change it? Do any of your stuff over there uh, see any kind of traffic from this or anything like that? Nope. Nothing we yours didn't was see any disruption at all. Nice. Good. The only disruption we've seen recently was uh, when some fiber got cut uh, between Montreal and Newark that uh, caused some issues for us. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> what if fiber gets cut? That's no. Basically, happy. there were two bundles, 10, 10 gigabit fibers. So nice. two yeah. separate links that are basically 10, 10 gigabits put together. So 200 megabit links, or yeah. sorry, 100 gigabit links. One that goes from Montreal to Newark and one that goes to New York, I think. I forget where the destinations were. Or sorry, it was, there was, it was from the data center, which is in uh, Beauharnois, which is in Quebec. One ten, 100 gigabit went to Montreal and one went to Newark. And both of them were cut, leaving all the traffic to be routed over a much slower backup link, which caused my server to be able to push like five megabits of traffic instead of a hundred megabits, or sorry, a thousand megabits. <laughs> yeah, you see the server's like, do-do-do, doing like, you know, 50 megabits a second of video, and uh, which is a slow day for us. Uh, and then all of a sudden it's doing like five. It's like, what's wrong here? Oh, the fiber was cut. And then it goes back after. It was just an interesting situation because it didn't show up on our monitoring because the server wasn't down, it was still up. No, Newark is in New Jersey. It happens to be a major peering point on the internet. Alan's talking to the chat room. You should join us live, jblive.tv, Thursdays at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 Eastern, or you can also tune into the audio stream at jblive.info when it's working. Hey, Alan, why don't we take a break and uh, thank our sponsor this week? Yes. All right. That is, of course, the fine folks over at godaddy.com. Godaddy.com. Longtime supporters of the TechSnap program, and that's because they know that you guys out there are often in the position where you need to deploy something quick, you need to delegate administration. GoDaddy fits all of those requirements quite well. Of course, GoDaddy is the world's number one domain name registrar with over 55 million domain names, 5 million websites hosted, and uh, one of the things that I love about GoDaddy as somebody who's a little busy is that they just manage a lot of these things for me that I don't need to worry about. Or let me, uh, or, you know, one of the other things that's really great, I talk about this all the time, registering a domain and then letting somebody else manage that domain for me. Love yep. that functionality of it. I love, the, I love the idea that I can go somewhere to a name I, I trust, to an account holder I already have, and spin up a new instance of something, and that is what's great about GoDaddy. And look, when you're over at GoDaddy.com and you want to get yourself a .com, use our code TECH295. That's right, TECH295 is it's back. back. Yeah. It's back for a $2.95 domain. Now, uh, you can also do, and it, you can also do which is great a transfer now you get your first uh -huh. domain for two dollars 95 cents additional domains after that nine dollars 99 cents or take advantage of that transfer so you want to use that delegation feature i like to talk about all the time also we have the code still this is holding over from last month so there's probably only a limited amount left so go use it while you can go 35 off Four. Go 35 off four, saves you 35% off of a new order. 35%, boom, off the top. What else do you get 35% off? You get 35% off your gas? Nope. You get 35% off that burger you had for lunch? Nope. That coffee? Nope. But you know what you get 35% off? Anything you want over at GoDaddy.com. Just use the code GO35 off four or tech295 to get a .com for $2.95. And thanks to GoDaddy, I'm showing some clips from, uh, from that cool data center uh, Video uh, that they released a little while ago that we've shown yep. before, but it's always every now and then it's just cool to look at this and geek out. Yep, I love I love uh, all of the uh, hardware porn that they uh, they show. I want them to do more of this stuff. You can go check this I, out. I have uh, a bunch of bookmarks of uh, from another company that has some really good hardware. Oh, I porn. love this stuff. This is my favorite. Uh, I'm talking geek about out like this. how they they have like a time lapse of them deploying some new racks, and the the way they do it is they have two. Every server has. Five Ethernet cables coming out of it. Oh! So the, the four NICs go two each to two different switches. Uh, it's because they have an internal network, like a private LAN and a public LAN that you connect to. Each one has two separate NICs. So sorry, yeah. There's four switches in each rack. So each server gets a, one connection to each of the four switches: two for public and two for private. And then the fifth one uh, that does for the management for the IPMI. No, it wasn't Pier One or OVH. It was. Software, I think, but it's same. All of the places do the similar thing. 
Uh, but it's just showing them laying all the cables by hand and stuff and how they zip tie them back and it just looks really pretty. Oh, I like that stuff. So uh, yep. anyways, two, Tech 295, $2.95 and uh, Go35 off four when you shop over at GoDaddy.com. And thanks to GoDaddy for the longtime support of the TextNet program. And thanks to everybody who goes and uses those links in our show notes. That just lets GoDaddy know that you're paying attention. And even if you're not there to buy, you can at least check out what they have to offer. And it shows them you're paying attention and you appreciate them supporting the show and keeping us on the air. All right, Mr. Drew, why don't we shift gears? <coughs> Sorry, I'm not very good at driving. <coughs> and talk a little bit about taxes. It's kind of well, tis the season, kind of. right? Uh, well, you know, we like technical things. Yeah. And, oh, that's, things and I hate taxes. I yeah. hate so, taxes. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. So basically there was uh, a large data leak on the internet, as we've seen before. Oh, that's weird. Uh, except for this one was interesting. <laughs> uh, so yeah, basically this gives us an inside view of how tax havens actually work. Okay. So the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists uh, in one way or another, came into possession of 30 years' worth of files, emails, and other data from the 10 most popular offshore tax havens in the world. Whoa, that's quite the find. Yeah. The files cover more than 120,000 offshore entities, such as shell corporations, trusts, private foundations, international business corporations, wow. and so on, and involve people from more than 170 different countries. Somebody's going to wind up dead. <laughs> uh, the leak totals over 260 gigabytes of data, Whoa. making it 160 times larger than the WikiLeaks U.S. diplomatic cables dump. It's a lot of money. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, the data details the structure of a number of different schemes and includes details on uh, the people that hold these offshore accounts and data they'd rather keep secret. So generally, the idea with these offshore accounts is you set it up with like what are called nominees. So instead of having the directors of the offshore corporation be the people that are hiding the money, you, they're basically people from these little islands and so on whose job it is to sit on the board of this corporation. They get paid a small amount of money or whatever, but the control is actually maintained by the people whose money it is. But on paper, the people whose money it is have no connection to this at all, right? Because the whole point is to hide their money. Mm -hmm. uh, the documents create the links between the people and their offshore money and basically allow us to find out whose money, you know, who is hiding money offshore and how much in some cases and what they're hiding it from in some cases. Uh, you know, and this is basically offshore money that governments have been unable or unwilling to find themselves. Sorry if I just moved your notes on you. Yes, you Totally moving my stuff. While I I'm apologize. Trying to read it. I was taking notes myself. <laughs> uh, so it's not clear yet whether the government would use this data to actually go after people from evading That's what taxes. I was wondering. Yeah, I mean, it seems like they kind of have to, don't they? Otherwise, they're well, just turning a blind although eye. I don't know how, as far as the court is concerned, how. Oh yeah, could be know, all legal, evidence right? Evidence isn't like technically legally collected necessarily. There's that, and uh, maybe they're not doing anything particularly illegal. In some cases, so. although uh, I would think we'll are. get to that a little bit oh, more. Okay. <laughs> but, um, so the CBC has extensive coverage, mostly because they have exclusive uh, access on this data for all of Canada. That helps. Uh, but you know, they have quite a bit of detail about it. Uh, and they've also created an interactive tool that teaches you about how hiding your money offshore actually works. So it walks you through the steps it takes to hide your money offshore. Mm -hmm. And some of the it's like a little how-to guide. Involved. Nice. Well, it's a it's a very nice uh, interactive tool. It's okay. Quite pretty actually. Uh, so the first step in hiding your money offshore is choosing which country to hide it in, right? Uh, and you know this report is about ten of the most popular ones, but it, so you know you can search through this list of countries and you see the pros and cons of each one. Certain countries have no tax rate, and certain countries have a low tax rate. Ah. Uh, some of them have information sharing agreements with other governments, right? So some of these countries will report information about what taxes you pay or should have paid in the foreign country back to your home country, right? Like U.S. and Canada have uh, an agreement like this, but also, you know, I think U.S. and uh, the Bahamas have a tax information sharing agreement where basically the bah Bahamian government will tell the Canadian government 
how much your money grew by <laughs> and that you might have to pay taxes on or something, right? Ah, uh, that's sneaky. Yeah, so you basically, you can flip through these different countries and find the one that, that looks most likely be what you're after. One that fits my needs, as it might be. Yes, so like, what are the tax rates in the different islands? Some of them have no tax, and some of them have a low tax, but maybe better privacy. So are you willing to trade a small percentage of the income you're earning in exchange for better protection from being found out? And that can also depend on what type of... Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Mm. Uh, and yeah, do they have a tax sharing agreement with your home country and so on? The next step is to create your secret identity uh, that will hide the true ownership of the wealth from your home country. Uh, so like, what, are you going to create an offshore trust that has you know, specific rules about how you can use the money? Uh, or you can create a private foundation? And then you can also create like a, a limited liability corporation or an international business corporation. Or if you don't want to do all that paperwork, you can buy what's called a shelf corporation, which is basically an empty company that's already been created and set up you know, like a binder and it's sitting on a shelf. And you can just go to an agency and buy a company that's existed for 10 years already. Right? And then just start using it to hide your money. That's great. That's brilliant. Or you can just create a regular bank account. Maybe I could sell places. Jupiter Broadcasting to be a shell company and make millions. <laughs> shelf company. It's different oh, than a shelf, shelf company. Right. A shelf right. company. A, yeah. sh a company sitting on a shelf that you can just buy is right. a shelf. I could a put it on a shelf. Is, That's fine. It's a company that just hides another company. I'll even keep it. making shows. They can use it as a tax haven and I'll keep making shows. They'll nobody ever know. Yeah. Uh, or you can create an individual account. The difference there is that your name is on it. So that might not work so well for hiding your identity. Uh, so next, you have to choose what bank you want to put your money in. So hmm. where is that bank based, right? Is it on right. one of these little islands? Is it in Switzerland or Liechtenstein or whatever? I'm feeling like uh, Cyprus, maybe. How secretive are those banks? And also, does your home government have any influence over that? Mm -hmm. Like two of the options in uh, the Caribbean are Canadian banks that just happen to operate in the Caribbean. So if you use, say, Scotiabank in uh, the Bahamas, I'm guessing there's some connection to Scotiabank in Canada and the Canadian government may be able to force them to turn over details. Right? So maybe you want to pick uh, a bank from an unrelated country. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's another thing is uh, you know, some of these people will basically create the private foundation or the trust in one tax haven and then the bank accounts in another. Right? So you get the extra layers of protection in multiple countries that your government would have to go through in order to connect the money back to you. Uh, then you have the next part, which is actually moving your money from your home country to the tax haven. Uh, if you've already paid tax on it, you could just wire it with the regular bank system, although that creates the paper trail. right? And if you're wiring more than $10,000, then that gets reported and you have to you know, explain the money. Uh, but really, the problem is if you wire a large amount of money, your tax agency is going to know that you sent a bunch of money offshore. And they're going to be like, well, we wonder if you're making any income off of that money offshore. Mm -hmm. And if so, you're paying tax on that. Uh, so if you go the above board routes, then they have you know, this indicator that they should be looking at you. Uh, so other options are you know, fill a suitcase with money. <laughs> although... You know, it's illegal to go through customs in most countries carrying more than ten thousand dollars without declaring it. Hmm. Yeah. But if you don't get caught, you don't get caught. Right. 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 And well, it's not like you hear people getting caught very often. I, I guess, huh? I mean, the the way I look at this is because I'm obsessed right now. Is I look at, I also think of like storing all of my all of my money that I would want to move on a thumb drive via Bitcoin in a wallet file and just putting that in my bag. And that could be ten thousand dollars easily, and nobody would know because it's just on a thumb drive. Right. Just, uh, of course. How did you get the money into Bitcoins? Did you wire that from your bank into Mt. Gox? And maybe. Just a connection yeah. Stuff, that's right? where they. You'd have to be some other method that's not using that, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one other interesting method is phony lawsuits. Have someone from the trust or whatever that you've set up, sue you, and then settle out of court sending them all your money. Oh. Now your money disappeared from your home country as a legitimate lawsuit loss. Right. Yes. Another one is what's called a money swap. Uh, this one's a bit riskier because it involves other people that might try to screw you. But if you know someone who has money on the island and wants to get it back to Canada, 
and you have money in Canada and want to get to the island, you can just trade bank accounts. Hmm. They would never be the wiser, would they? Right. I bet that happens all the time. <clears throat> mm-hmm. uh, of course, you probably want to go through some kind of escrow service or something. Otherwise, you know, they take your bank account and don't give you their bank account. Right, they right. Have two bank accounts the level of time. trust required there is quite high. Yes. And you're automatically dealing with people that are trying to hide their money from the government. So do you really trust them? <laughs> right. Well, yeah, that's true. Well, you're one of them. So, <laughs> so after that, you have to decide how scenario. to invest the money. All right. The entire point of getting your money offshore is to avoid paying tax on income that you make from this money, mm-hmm. right? Whether mm-hmm. that's interest or investment income or whatever. So you have to decide how risk averse you are, right? Do you want to invest in stock market or just a mutual fund or do you want to just, you know, there's lots of different ways to do it. Uh, and then the hardest part is spending the money. Right, so now you've hidden all this money offshore. Yeah, yeah. Now you want to spend it. Right, you have to either try to get it back on shore without having to pay tax, most with ways which are legal, uh, or you have a couple other options. You could move to the country where you hid the money. Right, right. If you hid enough money, then you can go live on an island and. Yeah, it takes right? a little pre-planning, but that could be really nice. Yeah, uh, one option is what's called a back-to-back loan, where basically you find a bank that is in the island and in your home country, you deposit the money at the bank on the island and then you get a loan for that amount of money from yourself, basically, at the bank in your country. Hmm. So it allows you to set any terms you want on the loan, right? Like say, you know, 0% interest and very small payments for 20 years or something because the bank's not out any money, right? You gave them the money in one country and they're just borrowing it in another. So eventually you have to pay it back, but um, in the meantime, you get to use this money you hit. Right. Which is obviously useful. Sure, no. uh, you can do insurance scam. In, in the island, you could take out a life insurance policy on someone who's dying and, then when it, and have it pay out to you legitimately in your home country. Right? And because money you get from an insurance settlement isn't taxed in Canada you would have the money free and clear after that. You know, it's funny, too, because it shows you, like, they, uh, like, the magazines here always have, like, the, you know, America's wealthiest people. But in reality, so much of this money that these people really have is offshores, offshore that they don't claim it, you know, that who knows how rich some of these people are. And when it's, when it's hidden like that, they're protected from all kinds of things, tax, uh, lawsuits, uh, you know. Right. Oh, I'm just about to mention that. Uh, two of the other ways are to spend your money is to get a credit card based in the offshore place. Yeah. So you spend the money here, but then pay the credit card bill there. Yeah. Okay. Although governments are starting to catch on to that. <laughs> like in the U.S., the U.S. government has actually gone after Visa and MasterCard over things like this. Mm. Uh, and the other one is a fixed gambling, where you gamble money and it actually has like a fixed rate of paying out and you basically repatriate the money as gambling winnings. Hmm. Right? So you gamble the money on the island and have it paid out indeed. Yeah. You know, you lose some of the money that way, but it comes legitimate. It's like yeah. legal, uh, it's like slightly legal money laundering. But yes, uh, people have a number of different reasons for hiding funds offshore. You know, other than the fact that you don't want people to know you have the money uh, because you gained it illegally by doing something illegal, <laughs> or you want to avoid paying taxes on the money or just on the interest and income you would earn on that money. Sure. Uh, but also a lot of people do it to hide money from the court. Right. If you're gonna right. go, if you're going to get divorced, you hide the money so that you don't lose half of it. Right. Uh, or you know, there was a lawsuit against you and you lost, and you know, a settlement for so much money. If you hide the money, you don't have it. Yeah, they oh, can't. Sorry, I can't yeah. pay right. that ten million dollars because I don't if have you, ten. Million. And if you assess my wealth legally, it'll come back and it'll show what I legally have in in the U.S. in those systems, yeah. and all that's on offshore is just totally off the grid. Right, because it's not owned by you. It's owned by a private trust that you are secretly a director of or yeah, whatever. Right. Uh, why is this on TechSnap? Mostly because it's interesting technical thing and because it was a data dump like WikiLeaks. Right? There was Somebody a breach, yeah. stole this information. And now or, we get well, to learn it looks how more it like works. a whistleblower, actually. But, uh, but the other interesting thing is just the uh, number of people on the list and the fact that a lot of these people are related or in the government. WC says this is just actually our attempt to drive up the, the price of Bitcoin. 
<laughs> or profiteering. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. So he says he's maybe we're just trying to drive up the price of Bitcoin. Maybe we're uh, as we go because I think as we're doing the show, the price is going up right now. That's ah, why. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, <laughs> speaking of Bitcoin, kind of had a rough week. Actually, actually, it's had a pretty crazy week. Yes. Yeah. Especially the guys over at Mount Gox. Yes. Uh, so there is a distributed denial of service attack against Mount Gox, which isn't really all that abnormal, uh, except for that it appears the attackers were actually attempting to game the exchange using the denial of service attack. Yeah. Which is where it comes. So the BBC reports that an ongoing denial of service attack against Mt. Gox, which is the most popular Bitcoin exchange, may actually have been an effort to influence the trading price of Bitcoins. So uh, in their talking with Mt. Gox, the BBC says that Mt. Gox suggests that the pattern of attacks makes it seem like the attackers are basically selling their Bitcoins at the peak price. Like when, say, Bitcoins are worth $145, they sell their Bitcoins. Then they start attacking Mt. Gox which disrupts trading, right? Because the website's slower, doesn't load. So that starts causing the price to fall. And it also creates fear, uncertainty, and doubt among people, especially the most uh, skittish people that have Bitcoins. Mm -hmm. So that causes them to start selling the Bitcoin, right? Because they want to get it before the price drops any more, which drops the price more, right? When you have a mass sell-off that drives the price down. Right. Once the price is driven down, the attackers stop the attack, swoop in, and buy up Bitcoins with all the money they just got from selling the bitcoins at the nice lower price. Yeah, so, so yeah, they they sell all their bitcoins at one forty five, then use an attack to drop the price to say one ten, then buy up uh, the that amount of bitcoins, which now gives them more bitcoins than they started with, and then they can just repeat the cycle. They did this yesterday. So and it, so when I woke up, I think Bitcoin was around one forty two to the one coin was worth one hundred and forty two dollars, and then the denial of service attacks hit, and I think it dropped down to you know low hundreds. Yeah. Um, and uh, I actually think the thing that was a little more surprising is here we are the next day, and it's it's flirting with 140 again. So well, it, part it, of that it, might be because <clears throat> when the attackers make the giant buy, that pushes the price up again. Right, and the other thing is is there does seem to be uh, just more people trying to buy right now. So, for example, Mt. Gox today has 13,000 people in the verif verification queue uh, just to be verified to buy bitcoins, and uh, last week it was nine thousand people, and uh, in the last month they created fifty six thousand new accounts. Yep. Um, so th they are seeing a huge, tremendous amount of traffic, and I, I think it just it would it would make a lot of sense that if you had the ability to attack a digital currency or the digital exchange like this, you know they hold they they hold they hold like seventy percent of all the trades. So right. you th you know you throw them offline, and the vast majority of people can't trade. Um, yep. But well, uh, just looking at the Canadian exchange, uh, yesterday when I checked, they traded $7.7 .7 million worth. They're up to $8.3 million worth today. Wow. And a couple days ago, that was, number was only $6 million. So in the last couple of days, they've traded more than $2 million worth of Bitcoins. Yeah, so there seems... I, I wonder if eventually... I mean, this denial of service attack will probably always work uh, but I think it's going to be less effective as people start to become a little more comfortable with the fact that things will come back online and they don't have to panic sell. Right, but also it seems to underscore a need for a more robust and diverse yes, trading system and exchanges. Yes. More yes. exchanges so that when one's down, there's still others to maintain the price. There's early talk you know, of... The Canadian, uh, account, the, the Canadian exchange was fairly stable most of the time during yeah, the attack. Yeah. There was some change in the price, mostly because they're like, well, you know, if, if Mt. Gox is going down, the game was probably going to go down, so I should, you know, maneuver or arbitrage, right? It's like, oh, well, the Bitcoins are worth a lot right now, so why don't I buy them cheap at Mt. Gox and then sell them on the Canadian exchange and mm -hmm. make the, the money off the difference? Uh, but that selling drives the price on the Canadian exchange down and the price on Mt. Gox up and brings it back in line with each other. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think it'll be important to have more exchanges. Uh, but as we've seen numerous times with Bitcoins, you don't want just some random guy to be starting an exchange because that never ends well. <laughs> right. Yeah, and the longer uh, companies like Mt. Gox are around, the uh, the more uh, refined they have their legal process worked out. Like uh, they really have a process now for verification. Like you are a bona fide, um, you know, tracked individual when you uh, start do, uh, doing trades on there now, and uh, they're following uh, regulations and guidelines, and so. They're yes, it's, it's, the, the Canadian virtual exchange has always been that way. It's backed by a, a real Canadian company that 
uh, had a separate business. This is a, it's a separate business now, but originally they were like a, a VoIP provider or something. Don't you think and, it kind of makes those them more entrenched then? Yeah. In a sense, yeah. Yeah, and you know they've always been serious about security. So. Yeah, that's good. Well, this isn't the Bitcoin Blaster segment, but uh, I do find I do find it interesting the way as more and more things go online, denial of service attacks can be used to manipulate crowd behavior because that's really what you're doing at the end of the day is you're manipulating crowd behavior uh, by by a denial of service, and that's pretty interesting stuff, especially as a currency is so uh, dependent on on. Um, internet availability, right? Because if, you know, if there's a denial of service attack going against a bank somewhere, it doesn't really generally disrupt me. But if Mt. Gox goes down, that, that, as a Bitcoin user, right now at least, that disrupts me. And there's early talk in the right. Bitcoin form about uh, some sort of P2P-based uh, exchange where uh, essentially everybody just have a client and it would be distributed across the network somehow. And I guess they're, they're looking to that, but mm-hmm. I, well, I have no you idea. Know, that's how, that how all Bitcoins were traded before the exchange was everybody on IRC, you know, trying to buy and sell. But. Right, right. Yeah. Interesting stuff. Alan's got links to uh, more info in the show notes. Go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com. Look for episode 104, and then just scroll down below the video and find links and additional info on a lot of things we talked about. Alan, I think that's all the news, though, right? Yep. All right, then. You know what that means? It's time to move on to the TechSnap Feedback! Thanks for sending your emails to techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com or popping that contact link at the top of our website or starting a thread in our subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv. Mr. Jude, are you ready for our first email? Yep. All right, it comes from Beardy. And uh, Beardy writes, hi guys, longtime listener and infrequent viewer. Nothing to do with your videos, but it's just that I mostly digest my podcast while walking to and from work. Hey, no, we make an audio version available just for guys like you. Anyhow... I'm dabbling in the exciting world of SSH and have my router set up to forward port 22 to my Raspberry Pi. I've played around with changing it to other ports for learning's sake, and in reading about SSH and ports on the web, I keep coming across rules for which ports are used for what, or what port ranges are used for this or that. Can you please Mm -hmm. explain where all of these rules come from and how I can find a list of what they are and or just clear up the port confusion that is swimming around in my head? Thanks. And he's in London. Well, uh, that's a very easy answer. Uh, the people who decide what port number is what are the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, or IANA. I like that name. Yes, uh, and basically it's their job to assign numbers for things like that. <laughs> yeah. uh, they have a giant list, uh, but they assign port numbers for what means what. They do, uh, they're actually the root of what's responsible for IP addresses, and they delegate to places like Aaron for North America and Ripe for Europe and so on. Uh, Autonomous system numbers, uh, protocol numbers, basically any number that has anything to do with the internet, where the numbers have to be the same across everything, they're responsible for maintaining a list of numbers, and they're who you have to ask for if you want your own protocol number, or if you uh, want to specify a certain port is your port number or something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And what is it... Uh uh, what's the, there's the file in Etsy that has all of the port numbers. Yes, ETC services uh, has a mapping of common names to the port number. Yep, so if you're on uh, a Unix Linux so box, go in there and look. Etsy basically services. what that does in your, in your thing is like if you're, say, using Netcat and you're like Netcat to this IP address and instead of typing port 80 for HTTP, you can just type HTTP and the ETC services file will resolve that. The same way that a host file lets you have a short name for an IP address the services file lets you have a short name for a port number. Right. It's very cool. And you can add your own if you yep. want to get crazy. So, mm-hmm. All right. Should we move on to George's question? Sure. George writes in. He says, uh, hey, guys, just watched episode 103. And I have a doubt that I hope you can answer. Is there any RAID configuration that would help in the case of an extended for corruption like we heard in that KDE disaster example? Um, he says, uh, or if maybe if you had bearing, like, would the corruption just be duplicated to the mirror? I would say that yes. VM snapshots are good enough. Yeah, I know that's essentially yes. The answer is yes. But he's worried about differentials and things like that. Yeah, yeah, the replication right. would do. So yeah. basically, yeah, if you have any kind of regular RAID, uh, if the corruption is in the file system, which is sitting on top of that RAID, then yeah, your, your corruption is just going to be replicated to all the drives. So what you need is some kind of snapshot to go back to from before the corruption, whether that's a backup or a VM snapshot or whatever, or... Uh, sometimes you can have something like ZFS uh, because ZFS isn't RAID. It's basically the volume manager and 
the file system at the same time. So instead of two separate levels, they kind of become this one level. And because ZFS is always copy on write, it means that the corrupt version didn't get written over top of the good version. It got written somewhere else, meaning that the good version is still there. Mm. So basically, corruption normally comes from when you shut down the system, usually not intentionally, in the middle of writing a file out, right? So if you're in the middle of updating a file, you're overwriting that file in place, and you only write half of it, that means in that file you have half of it is the newer version and half is the older version, or half is the newer version and half of it is just not there, or is gibberish or whatever. Mm-hmm. Right? So you have that problem. In ZFS, because you never overwrite anything in place, you write it to a new place. Right? So you write out the entire file, the changed version, then you update the pointer that says this file is at this block after the fact. Right? So that means that if you get cut off halfway through writing the file, that the original version that isn't, hasn't been overwritten is actually still pointed to as the definitive version of that file. Oh, and that's ZFS. why that works. That's so fancy. Did you see that the uh, ZFS on Linux team just made a big stink about how they've been testing for two years and now they, they declare it to be production ready? Mm-hmm. And what they're doing is they're using a uh, sun-licensed um, uh, ZFS, right? But it connects yeah. to a GPL-licensed GPL. yeah, kernel module, and then it's actually a native kernel uh, it's not like it's, it's not, they're not using uh, Fuse. They're not, it's not in user space. It's actually at the kernel level, which I think is yeah, but encouraging the, at least. But the CDDL code can actually go in the kernel, so it's it, it seems it talks like to a, that module and then that module. Yeah, it's yeah. Not, so it's yeah. so the ZFS is still not actually in the kernel. In the kernel, right? Right. No, well, you know. <laughs> uh, all right, Leon writes. Uh, he, uh, I'll kind of paraphrase because he wrote in. Uh, he was sort of inspired by uh, your toys. He says, uh, "I love your show, and I listen to it on my way to work in the morning." Quarter radio and last also, which means he needs to go check out Unfiltered Sidebite Info Show. I have. Uh, I may be late in submitting this, but I just listened to TechSnap 102 where Alan was talking about some of the toys he got in Japan. He wanted to mention the Edimax BR6258N. It's available on Amazon. It's very flexible and it has two Ethernet ports. However, there's also another, these are like your routers that you had, Alan. There's also another slightly cheaper option, the TP-Link TLWR700. Get ready for this. Ladies and gentlemen, accepts a USB 3G dongle that turns the device into a 3G hotspot. Huh? How do you like that? So he goes on to say, uh, these are both available over at Amazon US and UK, and he doesn't have the link for us at the moment. The cheaper option has uh, significantly more user-friendly. Well, that's interesting. Um... But he would overall recommend the Edimax if you don't need the 3G functionality. Well, there you have it. So thanks, Leon. I like that. I have to go check these out. I kind of, I don't know, kind of wonder as I uh, get ready to go to Linux Fest Northwest. I'd say uh, we'll put, if we can find these on Amazon, I'll put links to these in the show notes. You can guys go check that out. He says at the end here, thanks again for the show. I always use the Jupyter Amazon link when I'm purchasing for home and work. I'm a big Linux fan and work in Windows Shop, as you call it. But uh, I always get uh, your shows from iTunes on my phone and on my Apple TV. Yeah, that's good. That's good, man, as long as you enjoy it. As long as you enjoy it. Yeah. All right, Alan, next email comes from Bastion. Bastion writes, hello, I'm a longtime listener to TechSnap, and I would like to congratulate you on 100% uptime. You have good yes. content and well-structured. It's always a big show. Keep up the good work. Now, uh, Alan, he noticed he had a complaint about episode uh, 100. I don't know if you caught this. I did actually during the episode and immediately hated the background choice that I'd made for episode 100. But you had the lighthouse or whatever. Uh, yeah, we did the lighthouse and he's included a few screen grabs what looks like maybe from his mobile device here. You kind of had something growing out of your head in this uh, in this episode. So I'm sorry about that, Alan. You kind of had this red protrusion. Right. I don't know what you right. uh Yes, so sorry about that, Alan. But yeah, that uh, that was oh, that's Pocket Cast. Yeah, right on. So uh, there you go. There. So uh, he wanted to send that in, and uh, he said uh, also that he's been having problem registering on our forum, and he noticed the captcha is not working. Yeah, we're not taking new registrations at the moment. We're transitioning away yep. from the forum. I get emails about that three or four times a day. And, we should uh, post uh, something on the registration page on the forum or something. Yeah, see, the problem is, is I don't even go there anymore. I, I, right. That's one of the reasons why we're transitioning away. So I just try to make a mention every... You're right, I should post something up there. Or I should just get it redirected into the Google Plus community. Mm-hmm. Go over to Google Plus and search for uh, the Jupiter Colony community. Brian writes in, 
with a very important shirt question. He says, where do I send my TechSnap t-shirt picture? I feel like I must have missed something. P.S. Love the show. I watch them throughout, throughout the week whenever I have some free time. Keep up the great work. So, Brian, email your shirt to Angela at JupiterBroadcasting.com, and you'll see that show up in a future TechSnap. If you've got a TechSnap 100 Patch Your S t-shirt, send that to Angela at JupiterBroadcasting.com. We're trying to collect all of those. Yep. All right. Our uh, next email comes from George, and then we're, we got one more, and we're done. George must learn more. He says, uh, check this out, Alan. I've been working as a junior Linux sysadmin for the last three years. First at an ISP. That's a good one. Administering mm-hmm. DNS, MX, HTTP proxies, FTP, web, and database servers. Now I'm working at an electronic money business doing more advanced stuff like SNMP monitoring, OS hardening, CVS admin, backup scripting, hypervisor administrating server, mirroring lots of maintenance for Windows, for migrating web servers and DBs. Now I need to implement more a more redundant infrastructure but I need help finding good books and resources to learn more. He's looking for a way to learn more about DNS load balancing, WAN high availability, link aggregation, more on Linux, like uh, maybe Linux uh, QoS traffic shaping, things like that, uh, web accelerators, web cache, any advice where he could start, books he could look at, courses he could take, anything like that, Alan, to dig into? You'd pass along? I've never read any books on that stuff. I know, um, I don't either. Uh, Michael W. Lucas writes on a couple of those things. Like, he just wrote a book on DNSSEC that'll come out shortly, uh, which is interesting. But no, I don't have any you know books what, to recommend. My, here's um, what my approach would be if you, if you really the want The one on books, web caches, I started to write one but never finished it. <laughs> what about this? If you really want to read a book, is uh, what I have found, the books that I have enjoyed the most is with the, a lot of times authors will have talks that get posted to YouTube. And I'll listen to like yep. their talk, and then if I'm impressed with what they had to say, or if I learn a little something, I'll go look, I'll go search their name on Amazon, and I'll grab that book. But I don't do it very often. But that's one way I kind of suss out the the right books to get is I try to yeah, get a and taste. Some of the topics he's talking about are, you know, appeal to such a small range of people that they never actually get published as a book. And right. you're better off just finding talks about them at conferences and, and yeah. know, usually on YouTube or well, something. Well, and they're moving fast, too, so it's hard to yeah. uh, write a book about it. That yeah, because I, I can't imagine a, a, a thick technical book about link aggregation. That just wouldn't happen. Yeah. All right. Frederick from Sweden writes in. But I'm, uh, I'm hoping to, to solve a problem uh, regarding link aggregation soon and publish a talk on it. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. Maybe stay tuned. I need some. <laughs> uh, well, the worst part is the credit for the actual idea that does it all actually goes to someone other than me. But Chatroom is pretty much universally recommending O'Reilly books, which I, yep. I would agree with. Uh, yeah, and that's when I was working on writing a book that was who I planned to publish it with. But Yeah, yeah. All right, so Frederick from Sweden writes in. He says, hi, guys. Thanks for the interesting podcast. Now, here's a little background, and you'll give us the question. I have a home server running Ubuntu server, the latest version, with six three terabyte disks and one separate OS disk. The six disks use SoftRate MDM. So I've got roughly 12 terabytes to use. I'm using extended four. The setup is dead simple without any issues at all. Um, he also, by the way, just mentions he has it hooked up to an APC, all those goodies. Now here's the question, and this is probably a question that's crossed a lot of people's mind. How can I test that the RAID actually works as it should? I have absolutely no issues, but I'm guessing I probably should do some sort of test to verify that it works as expected. Should I unplug a disk while the computer is on and just see what happens? And if I do that, how can I tell if it worked as expected? Anything crucial for me not to do as it would guarantee messing up the RAID? Well, he didn't mention what kind of RAID he has set up. But, uh, yeah, um, you maybe want to be careful about putting a disk. He's using okay. software So, yeah, so he's using okay. Linux's uh, built-in software RAID. Right, but... You know, you can that software where you can do like four different kinds of RAID. Three usually. disks and one separate OS. Yeah, I'm not sure how he has it set. Yeah, but if it's RAID five, then means uh, what you want to make sure you do is never lose more than one disk at once. <laughs> right. Right. Like, if you you know if you pull a disk out and put it back in, it has to resilver, which is basically write all of the data that was on it over again. Uh, and you want to make sure that uh, you wait until that's completely finished before you possibly pull out another disk. This seems um, like a risky thing to Pulling a try. disk out while it's running, unless they're hot swap bays that are meant for that, I wouldn't do that. Yeah. You power it off, remove a disk, and power it back on, uh, and it would have the same effect except for you know not risk frying a component by electrocuting it or something. Well, and just the firmware on those drives, expect a proper shutdown command and all that kind of stuff. Sometimes, it, yeah. Yeah, I, I, well, I, had a, I had an old drive that a guy pulled the power from that was running in a machine, and we lost the file system on it. 
Um, I have I haven't really had that happen very much, but it it did actually happen once before to me. So I've always been very scared since then. So I would say. Like Project Morris yeah, and, is saying, uh, yeah, yeah, you don't want to do this unless you have a full backup of yeah. your whole array. So usually you would do this before you start using it. Before you put the data on there. Um, well, you want to put some data on there so you can tell if it's corrupted, but it would be a copy of the data, not the only copy of the data. I, uh, I was just trying to think if maybe there was a safer way to do this. Like, Well, see, for checking that everything is okay afterwards... You almost need what ZFS has, which is a scrub command, which reads every byte and checks it against the checksum or every block and re- checks it against the checksum and make sure that it's not corrupted silently or otherwise. Mm. Yeah, that would be very nice. That would be very handy. That's ZFS, I tell you what. Uh, Jehuda, you asked about isn't SATA hot swap anyway. You, the, the SATA port is usually hot swap, although it really depends on the motherboard's controller whether it's supported or not. Yeah, the drive that but we pulled... The, that's it, different than pulling the power out. Yeah, yeah, we pulled the power and the and the SATA, and it was a, it was a SATA it was a SATA disk that lost the file system. Maybe it was just a bad disk, but I mean I've done it before and haven't had an issue. But. Right, I'm just saying if you if you pulled only the SATA cable, then you shouldn't lose much data. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess if you guys out there have a suggestion on how to test your RAID, uh, email it to us techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com. What have you done to try that out? And and did you lose any data? Um, Let us know. When when we had to move. Our eight disk ZFS uh, Z2 array from one disk controller to another disk controller due to a problem with the first disk controller. Well, a problem with this firmware. Yeah. Uh, when I was recreating everything on the new controller, I accidentally initialized one of the disks, which erased everything. So that did a test of what happens if you lose one disk in a ZFS RAID Z2. That was it resilvered part- and everything was okay. It was on purpose. It was a test. Yeah. yeah. Um, the interesting thing there is with ZFS, because it is the file system and the volume manager, not just the volume manager, like with MD admin or uh, hardware RAID, it knows which blocks on the disk have the active copy of the data and which don't. So when you resilver, it only has to write the data that's in use, not the whole. So on a three terabyte drive, if you're only using 500 gigs of that drive, it only resilvers 500 gigs. Oh, it doesn't write nice. all three terabytes, which speeds it up a lot. Oh, that is really nice because that's a pain. That is a pain. Yes, and uh, Rosalind in the chat room just linked to a, uh, an old story off Slashdot about why not to shout at your disk array. Right. Uh, where they had this big storage array and they were monitoring the read latency on the disks as a bunch of VMWares were running on top of it. And if they walked up to the disk and screamed at it, it the vibration made all the disks run slower until they stopped yelling at it. It's like the opposite of plants. Like you're supposed to talk yes. nicely to plants, right? Or any kind of vibrations are good for plants, I guess. But yes, yeah, so there was a guys. Mythbusters episode where they played different types of music to see which one helped the plants more. Oh, really? What was it? What was the most? I don't remember the result. Oh. Oh, wow. I don't think there was a result. It was mostly a. It was too hard to tell whether that plant grew more than that plant for one reason or another. Yeah, that would be hard and, to track. But mostly it was just like music versus no music was helpful, but different types of music didn't seem to have a major yeah. difference. Just the vibrations, man. Just the vibrations. All right, we'll go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com and click on that contact link and then choose the TechSnap program and send in your question to us or start a thread over at links.techsnap.tv. But Alan, that's all the emails we're going to get to this week because it's time for the TechSnap Roundup. And welcome to the Tech Snap Roundup. Yeah, that's what that crazy music means. Now, the Roundup are stories that didn't make it to the top of the show. We still want to talk about them, maybe give you some links to follow up on your own. And a lot of these links were supplied by the subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv. Mr. Jude, are you ready? I'll take the first one. So stand yep. by. Uh, this one came out. I saw this on uh, news.com. Uh, Apple's iMessage encryption has the feds all fired up because they can't crack it. Uh, internal, internal documents from the Drug Enforcement Administration complains that messages sent with Apple's encrypted chat service are impossible to intercept. And I think part of it is because, A, it's encrypted, and B, when you go into iMessage mode, it, like, it, it's hard for them to do a man-in-the-middle kind of capture thing. Interesting yep. read here, and I guess... Well, are- yeah, it's, it sounds similar. It's like, uh, you know, in Canada, we just had a ruling the other day that the police can't stu- snoop on your messages even if they're not encrypted. Yeah, yeah. Without a warrant, anyway. Uh, and, and while we're talking about mobile devices, uh, Google has announced that they start, they're going to start counting Android devices slightly differently. 
instead of doing the way that are activated against their servers, they're actually going to switch to reporting on devices that are accessing the Google Play Store. And then they'll provide developers with those numbers so developers get a little bit more of a clear picture of what user base is actually active and, I guess, purchasing right. apps. So in other words, if you're not using the Google Play Store, Google's not going to be counting you. You don't count anymore, I guess. Next roundup story, the untold story behind Apple's $13,000 operating system. Mr. Jude, I believe this is yours. Yes, so uh, this is basically uh, somebody managed to find all the documents and everything uh, from Apple's original creation of Apple II DOS. <laughs> and so wow. they, they have like the original contract that Apple put out and you know it shows that they paid $13,000 to write the original version of DOS for Apple IIs. Dear Steve, per our discussion two weeks ago, we are developing components of the Apple II operating system. It'll have a file manager, basic interface, and utilities for backing up, disk recovery, and file copy. <laughs> All the good old days. Actually, the bad old days, really. Uh, wow, $13,000 for that. Uh, another, uh, another roundup link tossed in here by Mr. Jude uh, on uh, Curbs on Security. Who wrote Flashback, the OS X worm? Yes, yeah, so it's basically his investigation in finding who actually wrote the worm flashback, uh, which was the, I think, the biggest, the first really big uh, malware for OS X. Right. And uh, incidentally also made the person who wrote it about $10,000 a day uh, at its peak. Oh, really? Oh, uh, nice. From uh, mostly ad fraud and so on. Uh, this one's kind of a creepy story from a uh, uh, BlackBerry Z10 feature. BlackBerry 10 can BBM anything you're watching, even if it's boring. Yeah, so the BlackBerry Messenger, uh, by default, it seems, does an announcement every time you watch something in the browser, the Z10 That's browser. Uh, and uh, well, it's BlackBerry's Canadian, so it's Z10 browser. Anyway. Oh, you're uh, right. Yeah, you're right. That's but legit. basically, yeah, uh, on the uh, forums, a bunch of people are posting that they've seen people sending out automated BBM saying they're watching random different porn sites. Blank is and listening like, to yeah. Pornhub.com and it's putting it on their or, Facebook yeah. feed. That is yeah. super embarrassing. Yes. And also, uh, porn on the mobile it, device it, seems constrained. I don't know. Yeah, I've, I've never thought people did it, but... I hear it's well, actually really quite someone big. who hosts a lot of the... Yeah. <laughs> it's like about what? a third of all of the porn is delivered to mobile devices. I guess on the go oh, the video that we do, yeah, maybe for bathroom stalls around the world. I, I don't, don't know. know, but hmm. uh, all right. Well, well, I guess part of that might be tablets. I've I've not actually broken down that much. I oh. just know. See, deliver. that would be more reasonable on a larger screen. I don't know. Maybe maybe now you're talking. Uh, not for me, but no. anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of uh, tablets, uh, this last one here in the uh, roundup. I'm not a PC repairman, and I will not get your iPad working. Yeah. <laughs> I actually end up getting people's iPads working quite often, turns out. But basically this story is uh, from a reporter who's an IT journalist, but basically his new policy of not telling people uh, that he works in IT because as soon as you do that, everybody wants you to fix their computer. Or oh, yes. You oh, should geez. magically be able to solve the problem they have with their phone or their ebook reader or their tablet or everything. Mm -hmm. It's like I tell people, uh, I do video streaming and, and like enterprise. Yeah. Uh, like like big iron networking. Yep. I don't. I right. can't solve your spyware problem with Windows. I don't use Windows. So I when people, I'm, even though even though I use, I do use Windows on this computer uh, here and everything, I, I tell people I don't because whenever I go somewhere and they ask me, I always say, I either say internet broadcasting or I say business computer administration because if I say I work with computers in any kind of if I any way I say that the first thing that comes out is oh well we've got this thing or oh maybe you could help us with or let my me email's ask not you. working or my iPad's not working so, mm -hmm. ah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean it doesn't matter what I'm doing it always comes up so yeah I I get that well why don't we uh, shift gears right now uh, it's a little retro here we're gonna go to the uh, old style Bitcoin blaster uh, <laughs> <laughs> you like that Bitcoin service Insta Wallet has been suspended indefinitely. After a hack, this actually, I think this hack came just around the same day that Mt. Gox was getting their denial of service attack. So, yep. busy day. Remember when I got, my, I had an online wallet that was hacked. I, I lost, I lost, I lost thousands of dollars of bitcoins. Actually, now that I think about it, at the price. I mean, at the time, they were only yep. worth thirty dollars. But I mean, I lost. Well, it, it's, it's the worst part is knowing that I lost. Like I had 60, a mining rig. Seventy bitcoins. Well, I had a mining rig that I split three ways: uh, one share to me, one to and one each to two of my friends. And in total, we generated about 150 Bitcoins. Nice. At today's market price, those Bitcoins would be worth over $20,000. Wow. We sold them and got about the $1,000 back to cover the cost of the hardware we built 
the Bitcoin yeah. mining rig. Yeah, yeah. I so only if we'd known and just sat on them for a long time. You got to be really careful of these online wallets. Uh, you really have to be watched. This is a problem. Yeah, this is going to be a problem. Trusting random other people on the internet with your money is probably a bad idea. Uh, just like you know, uh, you know, just. Just think about, uh, check out some offline wallets. I'll put a link in the show notes to one called Electrum. There's two things I like about it. Actually, three things. First, it, it, they use uh, uh, this hosted blockchain service, and it's not proprietary to them. There's lots of people that are hosting it, and there's they have a server status page. So you don't have to download the two gigabyte blockchain to load the Bitcoin client, which is nice. It also has a forgiving feature where your wallet can be recovered from a secret encryption seed, which is interesting. I got to play with that. It also mm-hmm. supports some offline wallet functionality. So go check out Electrum. It's cross-platform, and it's pretty great. And then if you have to have an online wallet, go check out blockchain.info. One of the interesting things they do is they have a Chrome app that does all of the encryption locally. So the only thing you send to the blockchain online wallet is an encrypted version of your wallet. But I, I, even then, I would still, I would if you can, you know what you probably should do is like use the local Bitcoin wallet for like your big storage and then use the online wallets for like a little bit of money for easier transactions with mobile devices and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But uh, if you're interested in the Bitcoin topic, stay tuned for a, a beta episode of a Bitcoin show that Jupiter Broadcasting will be working on. Just follow me on Twitter. I'm twitter.com slash Chris LAS or uh, go to bit.ly slash Chris Fisher to follow me on G+. I'll announce when we'll be doing a live stream beta version of our upcoming Bitcoin show. Fun. Yeah. All right, Alan. Well, I think that's everything we have for today, yeah? Yep. All right. Well, there you have it, everyone. Don't forget, TechSnap is live on Thursdays at 1 p.m. Pacific for Eastern, which is? 2000 UTC. Boom! I love that. Over at jblive.tv, and then we're available for downloads Friday mornings over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning to this week's episode of TechSnap. We'll see you right back here next week. Bye.